Our guest today is documentary photographer and filmmaker Alice Aidy. A creative storyteller striving for a better future, Alice has been on the front line of social movements from the climate and refugee crises to the fight for women's rights. Having just returned from reporting on the Ukraine-Poland border, she's here today to share why we should never stop trying to build a better world, how you can find your role in the social justice movement, and why flourishing is not a solo mission. It's about creating the foundations for all people and all the planet to flourish along with us. So Alice, thanks so much for, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Great. So I guess start with what's obviously really present for you. And I know you've just come back from the, the Polish-Ukraine border. Mm. Must, be encount- must have encountered trauma, suffering. And so I usually start this podcast by asking what people are grateful for, and that might seem a bit out of place here. But I also know that encountering suffering can can also lead to deep gratitude too. Mm. So I'm, I'm interested to know, is there anything like right now that you feel grateful for? Um, I think it's exactly the right time to speak about gratitude in a way, sure. having just come back from the border. Um, it's not hard. It's It's hard not to really take count of everything I'm grateful for um it's really hard to talk about these things I think without feeling like you're falling into cliches and and platitudes you know as you say there is a huge amount of suffering and trauma and I often can't find the words really to do these situations justice um Mm. of course I'm grateful for the most basic of things a roof over my head um and yeah I'm thinking a lot um these days on my return and even this morning just about the duality of things. You know, I saw, yes, the suffering. You also see the extraordinary resilience. Mm. And, you know, people often say that you see the best and worst of humanity in these moments. And I have to say that was really starkly true um, these past days on the Ukrainian border. Mm. An extraordinary volunteer response um, to the now two million refugees that have come out of Ukraine. Those are the recent figures, and they'll, I think, only go higher and higher. Um, Amazing open-heartedness of the people receiving Ukrainians. But at the same time, in the border town where I was, there were two Nazi rallies um, against African students coming out of Ukraine. Um, Countless examples and testimonies about racism for those trying to get out and the Mm. prioritizing of white Ukrainians. Um, And so I'm thinking a lot about that sort of duality the light and the dark um the best and worst and um you know I feel quite emotional these days coming Mm -hmm. back how do you hold space for all of that um you know the amazing warm reception for Ukrainians across Europe um at the same time you know for years the first four years really of my career I documented the Syrian refugee crisis yeah how can you stand in solidarity, of course, as is absolutely necessary with new Ukrainians, um, celebrate the open heartedness of Europe's response, but also grieve, frankly, that the same governments and the same border guards mm. and the same borders who have used batons and dogs against Syrians coming through have now got open borders. So, um, you know, how do I come home? And again, I, I, I'm so uncomfortable to yeah. um, speak in this way because of course I get to parachute in and parachute yeah. out and there's a lot of discomfort in that. But to come home and, you know, the moment I got home, I was starving. I went with my partner, we went out for dinner and, you know, I, I think to him, I probably seemed a bit shell-shocked and, you know, I sort of look around this restaurant and these incredibly happy people drinking, yeah. having dinner as they should here in London. The world can't stop, right? But um, it just reminds me actually of something that I read Um, that was spread around Instagram these past weeks. At any one moment in the world, someone is clinking a champagne glass in celebration and somewhere else a bomb is exploding. Um, So how do we reckon with that? And how do we sort of, yeah, understand it, make sense of it? I I think it's hard to make sense of it really, but I guess just emotionally engage with all those truths at the same time. Definitely. I mean, you've asked a few questions there. Like, (laughs) how do we, how, I guess my question is almost asking you those questions again. Mm. How do you contain that? Because this is, I mean, this is not the first suffering that you've encountered. Like, it's part of the work that you do. So, how do you confront and contain the suffering that you encounter (laughs) and 
maintain a sense of well-being at the same time because I think that's important otherwise you lose your capacity to do the important work you're doing so I'd be keen to hear that yeah I can feel in my body the immediate reaction for me is a sense of discomfort because it's sort of like how can I even be asking myself this question when the people that I'm meeting are the ones who have the lived experience and nothing that I experience sure. can possibly compare um, but of course I'd be lying if I said that I don't get emotionally impacted. In fact, the day I stop being emotionally impacted, I should probably stop this work. And it's something yeah. that you see in a lot of um, certainly conflict photographers and, and war journalists is a level of desensitization, um, I think that is really dangerous. So yes, I do get emotionally impacted. Um, I do internalize the experiences of these people, um, which is part of the work, part of being a documentarian. Mm. Um, I think I've got better at it. I remember in the early days um, of my work documenting the Syrian refugee crisis, I I felt um, a level of anger and outrage that I remember really holding in my body and not knowing how to process. And I can see it in a lot of, now I've moved on to a lot of climate work and I yeah. can see it in a lot of climate activists. You know, when you are really passionate about your issue as you know, you are very right to be, there can be a sense of why isn't ev why doesn't everyone care about this? Yeah. Why isn't everyone looking at this issue right now? Um, I, I remember that so viscerally and I didn't know how to process my emotions. And so I, I didn't do it. And often my camera is, you know, you're so focused in the moment of, I need to get this story out there. And for me, that means making sure my camera's in focus and the technicalities of the mm. work, the camera becomes a kind of barrier. And it's always in the car journey, leaving on the plane ride home, um, or even looking through the images or the footage that you, you know, the emotion kind of passes yeah. through. And I think I've got better at doing that more immediately. So, you know, I was very emotional the day I got back tears and, um, I think have been processing it these few days that I've now been back from Ukraine. So more immediately doing that, I think is much better because otherwise it, you can feel you, you hold it and it, it, it's, it's, it's toxic and it stays yeah. in your body, but it, it's a practice and it took me a long time, I think. And also there was a level of, um, I was very young when I started the work and I think I sort of was holding the weight of the world on my shoulders in a way. Um, I, I thought I could hold all these emotions of the people I met. I would stay in contact with them. Yeah. I would go back to visit them. Um, and I think over time, I just realized it isn't possible. So there's, it's striking that balance between having boundaries, not boundaries that make you um, desensitized or lacking in compassion, yeah. having that compassion, but actually protecting yourself so you can show up as well as you can for the people that you meet. Definitely. I mean, that, that's so important. But like you say, if you become debilitated by what you're encountering, then you lose your capacity to make an impact. Totally. So do you, you've, you've mentioned the word work there. Do you see it as work or do you see it as something different? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, I don't really see it as work, I guess. Mm. Um, I feel I mean thinking of gratitude I guess that's one of the things I'm most grateful for in my life is that I live from my passions yeah. um, and I have an immense sense of purpose I think I was really lucky to find what I wanted to do you know I studied history and politics I was always passionate about conflict international relations yeah. geopolitics um, that was sort of academically what I was interested in but I knew despite my interest in journalism that I would maybe never be a writer, but I knew mm. I would kind of convey these stories visually. And so that would be through photojournalism and documentary film. Um, my heroes were, you know, war photographers in my teen years. And actually someone who's really on my mind at the moment is an extraordinary American photojournalist called Lindsay Adario. And right now she's in Kiev mm. on the front line. Um, and just two days ago, Putin has been claiming not to, um, be attacking or targeting civilians specifically, but yeah. she took an image of a family who were trying to evacuate and were specifically targeted, yeah. um, who lost their lives. Um, so she's really on the front line. And, and I had read her book when I was about 17 or 18. Um, and I ended up meeting her. She has this extraordinary story, been kidnapped twice. She works for the New York Times, some of the biggest mm. publications, has really risked her life to, to bear witness. Um, and I would end up meeting her through an amazing um, turn of events and became her assistant for years uh, and 
yeah, I've wow. just recently uh, had to have these kind of conversations where she sort of said to me, Alice, you don't have time for me anymore. And I sort of had to say, it's true, I can't be wow. your assistant, but I, I have so much admiration for her. And for me, I've actually learned a huge amount from her in terms of all these conversations around channeling and processing emotion because yeah. she's one of the the rare examples in that world I think who is not at all jaded and I think she's very blessed and gifted to have an amazing family network really good mental health mm -hmm. um, but she's been in extraordinarily traumatic situations um, and she manages to handle it really well and I always joke she's off the plane from documenting the atrocities in Yemen and then she's yeah. you know with her son baking cookies having stepped off the plane an yeah. abundance of energy and passion uh, that drives her and is no doubt driving her every day right now in Kiev and do you think it's a really strong connection to the purpose that helps you to navigate those emotions in a constructive way because you know that by doing so you're able to you're more likely to be able to fulfill the, your purpose. Yeah, I think she knows exactly what she's doing and why. Yeah. And I think if you have that sense of purpose um, with a lot of work, and you know, she would never claim to do it on her own, but with the extraordinary family that she has, um, with her ability to really feel and experience those emotions, um, an you know incredible routine of exercise and and things mm. and you know I immediately the moment I got home I went straight boxing and you know we all have our coping mechanisms yeah. and I think it's really important to understand what they are and 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 do those definitely so you've mentioned boxing are there other other practical things that you do uh, I joke with my partner because. <laughs> He has meditation and I have boxing. <laughs> and I, I feel I laugh at myself because I, I think I probably desperately need meditation. I've never found the, the practice, but sure. um, I, I should. And I, I hope I will at some point. You mentioned earlier that you've always been interested in this and you've always had that purpose and that passion. I mean, I'm sure you, didn't, I'm sure you weren't born with that. So is there <laughs> something that happened? How did this unfold for you? Like, are, are there things you can remember from your life that really inspired what you're doing today like what did that how did that play out i i'm always curious with this with with mm. with other people what what moments what moments of yeah. inspiration was it a book was it a film um i am still asking myself that question i have no idea i do just remember i came i come from a family where we we spoke about politics at mm. the dinner table um i think we were always extremely curious about the world and i really um I really credit my parents for that. We were very lucky to be able to travel a lot when we were younger. So I've always been incredibly curious about the world. Um, very lucky to grow up, very privileged here in London. Um, I guess I definitely have a sense from a young age that whilst many of my friends maybe didn't question the world around them, the systems mm. that benefited us clearly, um, I was always asking questions and I, I think I had a very sort of profound sense of injustice um, and that's really at the thread of all my work I think. Yeah. I never thought I'd end up doing climate work but actually it's my work through the refugee crisis after leaving university um, that led me to climate because I basically for four years was sort of totally tunnel vision on this issue. Yeah meeting people um, across Greece, Serbia, Iraq, Lebanon, um, who were forced to leave their homes with all the, the pain and suffering that comes with that. Um, I think people forget Syria is now in its 11th year hmm. of conflict. It's sort of an extraordinary um, historical event. And of course, Putin is involved in that as, uh, as he is now involved in Ukraine. Um, but what I realized, and this was a big kind of penny drop moment, was that um, climate, this yeah. issue I had never engaged with. Mm. Um, I think I had, like so many of us, sort of a uh, stereotypical idea of an environmentalist that I didn't associate with at all. Yeah. I grew up in a city. Do I love nature? Of course I do. But um, I think I saw climate change as this, this event, this um, issue that was happening in a vacuum as if separate from humanity yeah. and I saw myself as someone who cared about human rights and social justice and I didn't see the link with climate sure. and through the refugee crisis work I realized what is what is the single thing that will make this issue refugee movements forced migration worse it will be climate yeah. change and I'm still 
sure that um, climate migration will be one of the biggest stories of the next few decades. It will redraw global maps. And the reason that it concerns me so much is think of the Syrian crisis and, and how much it impacted even the conversation in the UK politically. Immigration was a massive point of mm. contention around Brexit when actually in global terms, the number of Syrian refugees traveling to Europe uh, was really, really very small. Um, we're already seeing two million from Ukraine within days. I mean, um, mm. the numbers were tiny and yet it really destabilized politics. And I fear, you know, a shift to the right, uh, militarized borders and all the rest of it. And so suddenly I realized, OK, climate is actually this umbrella issue. Yeah. And of course, it's linked with social justice and human rights. It's a huge threat to them. Inequality may only get worse. Um, forced migration will only get worse. Women will be disproportionately yeah. impacted. The global south, black and brown people are disproportionately impacted. So actually, it's intrinsically linked uh, with climate change. And we've seen in the last two years, the language of um, you know climate justice and intersectionality really spread. Mm -hmm. uh, climate change isn't this single issue it's really linked with everything that we care about and so since making that realization i've really been traveling to climate front lines to document human stories um from climate change in the yeah. knowledge that it's not just a you know biodiversity issue as grateful as we are to the extraordinary wildlife programs and the david attenboroughs of the world um we have to tell the human stories from front lines as For well sure and those human stories are so important i mean there's a lot of facts and data that, ca that can paint a horrifying picture, but they don't seem to land with human beings. You know, they don't affect, they don't raise awareness and affect change in the same way that a human story or a, a picture or an image can. And is that what, what, why you think you've been drawn to that as your medium, mm. as it were? I may be biased, but I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do um, believe, however naively, in the power of storytelling yeah. um, with so much passion you know i think that as you say people don't engage with just abstract mm. graphs and numbers and we desperately need human stories because they allow us to connect not just with our heads academically intellectually but with our hearts mm -hmm. um and sort of the arrow to the heart um is really the way to engage people i think now um you know i was at cop uh in glasgow in november and it was like there were two cops coexisting. Mm. There was the the official, the blue zone, as they call it. And this is inside, everyone's in suits. It's the policymakers. Um, and it was sort of devoid of oxygen in there, both physically and metaphorically, you yeah. know. Um, no culture, no music, um, no celebration of what it is that we're, we're trying to save. Um, and that was really the soul of what was happening yeah. outside those gates. Um, incredible cultural events, indigenous communities speaking of their lived experience and just the tone of the conversations were completely different. Mm. And in a way, I think, you know, one is the head, one is the heart and they really need to come together. And, and for me, it's just symbolic of that. We, we really need to engage people emotionally. Um, and I think people are scared, they're, they're terrified. And, and I've gone on this journey myself, you know, I did my travels to climate front lines really i think came to terms with the gravity of the situation we're in and it's a really it's quite a terrifying and painful process and mm. um, because there's a level of acceptance of actually what's already been lost the damage that's already been yeah. done um but i think the point to focus on is now it's about limiting the amount of damage um and the stakes are really high but yeah. to not be scared of the grief i think yeah um, I think the grief is a really, really necessary part of it. But when it comes to storytelling, for me, I'm desperate to tell stories that make people feel not that they're powerless, um, but that they are powerful, that we can actually all do what we can. We may have different definitions of what activism is in yeah. our own lives, but of course we can all make a difference. That reminds me of something, I don't know if you've come across Active Hope. Um, as an yeah. eco-philosopher... And I can't remember her name, but uh, Active Hope. Active I Hope, love but, that. which is great because often the term hope can be seen as just wishful thinking. But Active Hope requires, and you've used this word, it requires outrage and optimism. Mm. Like they have to go together. Like it's, it's, you need to feel deeply into the gravity of the situation, like I think you've described. And you need to believe that we have the power to affect change. And then together that 
that's the only way really that we can create change. That seems to rem remind me of how you approach all of this. Is and that, that speaks to what we were speaking about earlier, you know, the duality. You need the outrage and you yeah. need the optimism. And to me, you know, I speak of radical hope because mm. hope is actually a choice. Um, yeah. given everything we're faced with, whether it's Ukraine, um, whether it's the climate crisis. And we need hope and optimism. I think people have lost sense of the fact that we can build a better world. You know, I see yeah. that in a lot of people my age. I think of people n like me and younger. You know, it wasn't so long ago that I think people thought about the future and it was a really hopeful and optimistic future. Mm. It was a future of flying yeah. cars and progress. And I think if you ask young people now, there's a profound sense of fear. And that's quite a recent shift, yeah. I would say, that tomorrow may not, in fact, be a better day. Mm -hmm. On a society-wide global scale, that's really significant. I think we're more aware than ever, how could we not be with the hangover of the pandemic, the ongoing climate crisis, um, calls against racial injustice, that we live in broken systems. Yeah. But I, through storytelling, if I can contribute in any way to making people believe this isn't it, this is not the yeah. best that we can design. This is not the best system we can design. We can do better and there is a better day coming and we can all contribute. So find your role. Yeah find your role and do what you can um we can't let go of that we can't let go of that hope and i can't even if it's just for my own mental health i can't live like that i have to choose for sure hope you said they find your role and, and you also mentioned the, the difference earlier between the policy makers and and the non-policy makers i mean i'm i'm guessing that it won't be policy makers and presidents and politicians listening to this for example <laughs> but your average everyday person would be like so what, what is your call or invitation to them within all of this? Like, I guess finding a role is an important, important part of it. Like, what is the invitation mm. for them? We need everyone. Mm. We need you. Um, so finding your role is really crucial. I think that it can feel quite overwhelming because you yeah. think, oh, it will be a scratch in the surface. It'll be a drop in the ocean. Nothing I do will make a difference. But if, of course, it does as a collective, it makes a difference. Um, find a community, join a collective. You can't do this alone. Um, these things feel insurmountable if you do try and do them alone. And yeah, maybe it sounds oversimplistic. Find your your role in the movement. For me, it's it gave me a lot of clarity. Um, I'm passionate about storytelling, and so I've built my life around um, that and and offering it. You know, we need the policymakers, we need the politicians, yeah. we need the artists, we need the poets, we need the creatives. Um, and actually, I would focus on the creativity point in all its forms, mm. all its varying forms, um, because it is through creativity and storytelling that we're going to engage people emotionally. Um, and I think that's what we need. I think through creativity, through art, mm. through filmmaking, through storytelling, we can paint a vision of a better world. And that's what we need more than ever. I think we're lacking... Um, a shared vision yeah. for tomorrow um, and and people feel yes we're in broken systems but that maybe this is this has all been inevitable that this is but it's not inevitable we can we can change it mm. we can absolutely change things and you can play a role in it to, to me this this requires soul and it's mm. it's uh and often if you think about create creatives and i think we can all be creative you know creativity is is, is vision and it's that's what we need but we need to be able to envision a better world and then at like a micro level start to affect that change and the only way so i think you're talking about action here which is so important but what's maybe even more important or maybe just a precursor to it which i think your work is doing is to change ways of seeing the world change beliefs change perspectives like that would then drive the right action mm. And I think even an openness to the idea that there are different perspectives and yeah. that other value systems exist. So my climate work has led me to um, work with indigenous communities and mm. I have learned so much from them because they've what they teach us is that an entirely different set of values exists. You know, I was recently in Brazil um, for a few weeks and it's just extraordinary to me that... Um, you know, it's it's like how you'd expect reading it in the newspaper. You're you're on land that is just maybe a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, twenty years ago would have been untouched 
rainforest, mm. the Amazon, and now it's soya farms as far as the eye can see. And you reach a boundary, um, literally a fence, where there is indigenous protected land at the boundary with non-indigenous protected land. And of course, the indigenous protected mm. land is beautiful untouched rainforest. The rest is soya farms. And to me, it's so fascinating that two completely different cultures are coexisting side by side and that there's a struggle between them. One is around extractivism, um, relentless growth on a finite planet, mm. profit at any cost. Um, the other is about a respect for nature. Beyond that, actually, even believing that nature and plants and trees have personhood, that plants are people. Um, a reciprocal uh relationship with nature uh taking just what you need not more than what you need yeah um there's so much to learn from them and and not just in an abstract philosophical sense this is really crucial and important and um you know indigenous communities are more and more thank god uh considered climate leaders and conservationists and yeah. there's one fact for me that really embodies this it's indigenous communities are five percent of the global population but they protect 82% of wow. global biodiversity. Wow. That is yeah, it's amazing. extraordinary. Um, they are conservationists, they are climate leaders, and they really need to be taken seriously both for their role in climate solutions, but also their philosophies and their ideas. Um, and just to understand that different value systems, different spiritual beliefs mm. exist for me has uh, been really eye-opening. And I think it's really, really urgent and important. I was thinking as you were speaking there, it's about, you know, changing hearts and minds and part mm. of that is opening hearts and minds and opening yourself to more of the world, more of humanity, not just your own limited myopic perspective. Like that's, that's what needs to happen. And for me, what, one word encapsulates that. It's just curiosity. Be, yeah. be curious, wherever that leads you. And, you know, I think people, yeah, they maybe they're suspicious of words like hope or mm. action. Um, I think just ask questions. Sure let your life be be led by asking questions and being open-minded. We've lived in a monoculture of ideas, if you think about it. Mm. The past few decades have been dominated by one kind of belief system. Um, you know, our religion has been capitalism, but what yeah. if something else exists or what if something else could exist? And what if we need to actually fundamentally question what we mean by development and progress if we're destroying the very planet we live on for sure i read that you were on the 2018 sunday times alternative rich list mm. which to me is like i'm guessing a response to the traditional focus on what um living a successful life is you know what being wealthy means um so i'm keen to hear what your thoughts are on that but one thing i think is really interesting is that the word wealth wealthy it derives from the old english word wheel or i don't know pronounce it w-e-a-l and that used to mean uh well-being mm. welfare happiness wow. so wealth used to mean that and now over time it's become a, it's solely associated with the accumulation of money um, and that sort of seems to remind me of the kinds of things that you were speaking about earlier so what does that mean to you? Well, first of all, what, was it, what did it mean to you to be on that list? But also, what, what does that change mean to you? That we associate prosperity with money when it used to not mean that? I was really proud to be on that list because, mm. as you say, I think it celebrates um, a different set of values, uh, which I was <laughs> really proud yeah. to be part of. Um, I think they named things like courage um values maybe that are underrated mm. in our current society although i think that younger generations are really questioning i think we are questioning the stories maybe we've been told um about the the pursuit of wealth and fame um i think we have too many examples now of, of that going mm -hmm. being a flawed a, a flawed narrative um yeah i would go back um to what I've been learning from indigenous communities is what do we mean by wealth, development and yeah. progress? And actually I think of a conversation I had just two weeks ago um, with one elder of an indigenous community, the Tupinamba in Brazil. And I literally had a conversation explaining to her the concept of loneliness. Mm. This was something 
she could not understand it's just not something that exists wow. and in fact um suicide is something that's very rare in indigenous communities um and certainly to her 65 years old mm. um she couldn't wrap her head around it you know they don't have locked doors um there's always members of the extended family and this feeds into you know i thought about how i have a really dear friend who i'm working with at the moment nina Gwilinga, um an indigenous activist from ecuador and she's a young mother and she speaks a lot about indigenous motherhood you know that saying it takes a village you know how different is motherhood or even yeah. married life when you have the extended family yeah, network well. around multiple women breastfeed the same child mm. your child is running around completely safe with loads of other community members um i think we have such high expectations almost of the relationships in our lives in nuclear families where we have locked doors and you know we yeah. have wealth and prosperity quote unquote um but at what cost? Yeah. You know, we have a mental health crisis. Um, so I really think we have to hold a mirror up to ourselves and, and ask what is the society we've built and, and how can yeah. we move forward now learning from people who've done differently, who, by the way, have been shouting from the rooftops about these things and maybe it's really time we listen to them. Definitely. They're talking about the kind of society that we can and should build. Mm. You know, this podcast is called Flourish. It's about flourishing. But a central message that I would like to come through is that it's almost like no, we can't truly flourish until we live in a world that um, offers the opportunity to everyone to be able to flourish effectively. And and so it's it's that interdependent thing that's so important. And and like you say, our culture is moved away from that. It's very sort of isolationist, and the, the antithesis to this kind of uh, it takes a village uh, mentality. So I think it's a really important point that you mm. that you raise. Yeah. I think completely lost a sense of community in it all, yeah. you know. We've all been, or well, many of us, um, <laughs> on the tube here in London at rush hour. And, sure. you know, you look at people and we're all on our phones mm. looking down, not communicating with each other, no warmth. Um, I don't know how we got here, really. <laughs> I really And is, is that what, and I, I think this was a few years ago, but is, that, is, th is this uh, thinking that what inspired your disconnected documentary that you did yeah i read a headline and i just couldn't believe that i was reading these words but that the uk had um brought in a minister for loneliness yeah. i just couldn't believe that that was a thing um and so that 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 led me to make this short film about loneliness where i set up an answer phone machine where young people could call and and leave a voicemail and it was in a really interesting format because there was such an intimacy to the messages that people mm. left, you know, when they yeah. weren't on camera, um, which is always the way that I'd otherwise made films as a camera just yeah. a few inches from people's face. Um, but there was an extraordinary level of honesty and, you know, uh, the, 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 the voicemail was filled multiple times. You yeah. know, I got this really tangible sense that people wanted to speak about this. Um, I think that it's a massive, massive crisis. And is at the root of all of the things that we're talking about is people aren't physically isolated, yeah. um, but they feel desperately lonely. Um, and, you know, I ask myself a lot of questions about social media and how we communicate, you know, just the promise of social media and how we thought we would become more connected than ever. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not... I, I don't think it's fair to oversimplify it and just say that social media has, has made society worse. I think it's one of the most complicated questions there is, but certainly it has failed to deliver on its promise and we live in more polarised world than ever mm -hmm. um, and are going further and further down echo chambers. You know, even the past few days to reflect on the way that war a war is playing out across social media and how everyone posts about it or feels they should or feels they should be speaking about it. And then yeah. the very fact of consuming a war and consuming images of trauma and suffering in our Instagram feeds, you know, if it's my feed, you're flicking between Beyonce and trauma, food, sure. you know, how is that impacting us? Is that desensitizing us? And I definitely had a sense of that with the refugee crisis work um before with the syrian crisis is we became so desensitized to images of refugees crossing the mediterranean in those awful boats with life jackets um so how do we 
connect, stay connected, um, and yeah, not not become desensitized. I mean, one <clears throat> one way to stay connected or to reconnect as like a group of people is to reconnect around suffering, you mm. know, common trauma, common suffering. So, and this is certainly not to paint a or to try and seek out a silver lining in such a terrible situation that we, and I say we, but I mean, yeah, yeah, that people are faced <laughs> with right now. But but there is the opportunity to to wake up and to connect as human beings around the the really important things, and, n- and not to be so polarized around. Yes, importantly, but but not as important as what we're talking about now. Like I think it's an opportunity to to realize what we should be focusing our attention on which is creating a compassionate world a world that like i say uh um supports flourishing for all people like they sound idealistic uh, it's an idealistic vision but that's what we should be doing as human beings i think we need idealism <laughs> yeah yeah you have yeah you have to i want to ask you back yeah how did you how did you reach this point why flourishing why flourishing yeah um i guess you know, I've had my own story. I had depression in my 20s, well, from 19 to my 20s. Um, and the way that I, let's say, this might be the wrong term to use, but overcame that or moved past mm. that, moved through it, and was to start to find a life of meaning and purpose, um, to discover my own agency and 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 live that in the world mm. uh, willingly intentionally start to connect more with people um, follow my passions and and my life is transformed because of it mm. and so I'm really passionate about that and I'd want all people to live a life where they feel like they're able to bring their full selves to the world um, so there's that and then I've been in the mental health space for a while now and I think for too long mental health has been equated with just the problem sets and so mental health is been used interchangeably with mental ill health and so and i think that it disempowers people makes people feel like they're helpless that they can't discover their own agency and and change their lives so there's that part but also by by seeing mental health as 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 a beautiful thing as something that that is it's, it's positive flourishing for example invites a question how can we create the conditions for that so that's what i'm really passionate about is that just start asking that question and I think that can apply across everything we've been discussing today um yeah so I guess that's that's sort of why this is uh, important for me I, one word really stuck out for me which is agency mm. and I think that makes me think of all the young people that I speak to who are feeling really terrified for all the reasons that I was saying we're living in broken systems will tomorrow be a better day the climate crisis it feels yeah. overwhelming and insurmountable but in a way you know once you realize you do have agency um coming together around some of these issues mm. can be the sense of purpose that so many young people I think are lacking Definitely. and so there's a huge amount of promise in that in itself and we're already seeing it you know unbelievable youth strikes protests yeah. the way that people are gathering online um using their voices for good um but it does start with a sense of agency i can make a difference and yeah. my voice should be heard yeah um however i choose to have it heard or however i choose to use my platform or my privilege um and i think there's a lot in common between us and how we want people to actually step into their full power and potential yeah. and become change makers yeah know? i sometimes describe it as like just finding that spark even if it's a small spark and then you you know you fan it but it's about agency it's about responsibility and and i hope it's not this isn't misunderstood it's not like you're responsible for all the, the bad stuff in your life it's 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 you have the power to affect change even if you start small but mm. it's, it's reclaiming that responsibility or that agency that power but it's like responsibility for self for others for the world that kind of thing like that i think is what can really create change 100 percent. yeah we were speaking before we started recording earlier about jane goodall and, her, and how inspiring she was for you <laughs> <laughs> um are there other people that are 
that have inspired you and are there currently people or things that are happening that are the biggest sources of inspiration and hope for you? Mm. Wow, what a question. Um, I am constantly inspired. I find um, I love the idea that I can pick up my phone and there's just inspiration at my fingertips mm. every time that I open Instagram, go online. You know, I've, I'm a real advocate for curating the community that you want online. I think yeah. social media can make us feel so bad about ourselves, but it can also be a great source of inspiration. Um, and for me, that's filmmakers, journalists, storytellers, people like Lindsay, who I spoke about, yeah. um, extraordinary individuals like Jane Goodall. And yeah, I really want to pay tribute to people like that because I think they do embody so much of what we've spoken about in this conversation, which is living through purpose. And if you find that sense of agency and purpose at 80, you can be like her, I think she's older than 80 even. Um, traveling around yeah. the world, sharing her message with a passion and a relentless dedication to this issue uh, that I just find truly remarkable. And I often project myself into the future. How can I still be mm. doing this when I'm 60, 70, 80? Um, and doing that more actually has made me be kinder to myself today yeah um because i am trying to think about how can i still have the energy to be doing this um i used to put so much pressure on myself it has to be now the world has to change now you're not doing enough um huge amount of pressure because in a way when you're dealing with as i am social issues when is anything ever enough so actually when do you rest when do yeah. you stop mm. um it's really hard to because the issues feel endless and in a way the more you learn uh the less you know um <laughs> you know uh we live in such a, a complex and flawed world so i've never known how to stop really and that's yeah. something i'm thinking about a lot at the moment is how to rest because rest is radical you know to step Definitely. step off the hamster wheel sometimes um to look after yourself is really really important part of the process but inspiration for me comes in many many forms the jane goodalls the david attenboroughs those who've been doing it for a long time you know we stand on the shoulders of giants yeah. if you're like me a communicator and a storyteller um and more generally, I have mentioned young people mm. so many times with conversation, but I am really, really inspired by young people. Um, I think that they have a sense of responsibility that is really crucial. Um, that, you know, past generations maybe haven't had in the same way. And that gives me a lot of hope. I love it. So you <laughs> mentioned, um, and you may have already ha have, have said in what you've just said now, but if you were to channel your 80 year old self, like what, what would they tell you now? Oh my God. What words of wisdom would they show with you? It's very emotional to project yourself mm. into the future, isn't it? It is. I think about that sometimes in the context of climate because we think about we we're, we're told these numbers like 2050 net zero by 2050 climate devastation tw 2100 and they feel so abstract and far away but actually if you think about it in the sense of lifetimes mm. it's really not that far away and david attenborough one of the things i always think about with him is in his lifetime in a single lifetime we've gone from a stable climate to an unstable one wow. we've gone from one geological epoch into another we're now in the anthropocene and that's happened in a single lifetime um you could consider that to be profoundly depressing but i choose to see it a different way that if we've changed mm. the world this much in one lifetime um if we've got ourselves into this mess in one lifetime we can get ourselves out of this mess so when i'm 80 what would i say to myself today um the fight is a worthy one, um, but it's a long one. Just do the best you mm. can. So thank you so much. I mean, um, thank you for the work you're doing. Such important work. Thanks for your message of hope today. It's just been a real pleasure. So. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. Join us next time for another episode and another brilliant guest. 
Flourish is a podcast from Unmind, a mental health platform transforming the world of workplace well-being. To find out more, visit unmind.com or follow us on socials at unmindhq. You can also find me, your host, on Instagram at steve at unmind. See you next time.